<laughs> morning, everybody. Hope you're well today. Uh, it's an honor to be with you as always. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us online. I know there's a number of people who are doing so, and particularly because there's <laughs> a lot of sicknesses happen. So we're glad that you're with us as well. Um, before we jump into the Word, uh, yesterday was Veterans Day, and so I want to pause to recom uh, recom <laughs> recognize, that's what I want to do, recognize those among us here who are veterans. You've served in the military and um, the Coast Guard in reserves, what have you. So if you're a uh, military background, a veteran, if you please rise right now, that'd be great. We can recognize you. Okay. Thank you, men. Thank you, ladies, for serving us in that way, serving our country in that way. Uh, and by the way, there are notes for you if you are interested in having those. They're online as well, so go ahead and grab some. They're in the back and get them on the way out. Um, if you're online, you can find them there on our website, and those are for you to take a look at. Lots of stuff we go over. I get it. Lots of information. And know that this is not just a speech, nor is this like a religious exercise. We're asking God to speak to us, and more importantly, uh, we're asking that God would give us ears to hear what he may be saying to us, and perhaps he's already spoken something to your heart today. All of us in this room are coming from different places. I know some of the stories. There's no way I know all of the stories, and you are carrying things, be it joys in your heart, and often there's a mix, <laughs> joys in your heart, or concerns, or difficulties, or anxieties, and often we come with lots of these things. The prayer is that today that the Lord would speak to your spirit, more than a person, more than uh, a minister, that God would speak to your heart. And so that is our prayer when we gather together, and I hope that would be the case. Also, as always, I encourage you to get into your Bible. It's good to be here. God tells us to get together and to love one another, to serve one another. Church is important. However, Adding with that, it is important for each one of us to have our mind transformed, which is a continual process, through listening and reading His Word. All of us in this room, I trust, can read. And if you cannot read, then there's audio Bibles for you. And I listen to that as well, as long as I read. But I am encouraging you, as, as your pastor, if I can be so bold, that you would engage in reading your Bible on a weekly, well, excuse me, a daily basis, okay, beyond our daily bread, which is a good thing, right, that you would read the scripture. And so I encourage us as a congregation, if you've heard it from me for a long time, that we would read through the Bible in a year or read through the Bible twice in a year or whatever it is. And so there are some helps out there, some programs that start in the first of the year. There is a, a Bible, that, a print version Bible, if you like print verses, version Bibles that walk you through, and there's lots of resources. I want you to start thinking about, hey, for the new year, which is coming up soon, what are you going to do that God would speak to you through his word? Because the more you know his word, the greater you're transformed into the image of your son. You are strengthened, you are encouraged, you're given hope. Um, light bulbs come on. And so I'm asking you to do that and to think about that. Okay? All right. Grab your Bible. Okay? And there are Bibles in front of you and um, a few Bibles there that if you don't have a Bible or you don't have it on your phone, open up to page 927 in the Pew Bible. We're in John chapter 14. We're going to start with verse 15 to 30. And I'm going to ask Tom. Tom's going to pitch hit. Come on up here, Tom. He's going to read our passage for us. And as we read this passage, I want you to think about a few things, and these are going to be my points. I'm going to give it to you uh, in front of the message. So Tom's going to read. Okay, as he reads, this is what I want you to look for. Number one, I want you to look for the times in which Jesus tells us to obey. Okay, there's going to be love and obedience, and we're going to see this in the text. So if you have a Bible, underline it, or if you have an electronic version, just highlight it. Okay, so look for a time for the importance of obedience. That's our first point, by the way. So I want you to see in the text how often Jesus talks about that. Second, I want you to look for a promise that Jesus gives. Okay, 
what is the promise that he gives and what else does he give to us? Okay, so there's a promise and there's a gift. So look as uh, Tom is reading for us. Pay attention to the times in which Jesus says love and obedience or how important that is. Second, what is the promise that he gives to us? Third, what's the gift that he gives to us? Now these things Jesus is bringing forward in this context in uh, preparing the apostles for his soon departure. And so I want us to get in that mindset that Jesus declared to them, I'm leaving. He said to Peter, hey, your faith is going to fail. These guys are very anxious, probably knots in their stomach, like something horrible is going to happen. And he's preparing them so that their hearts wouldn't be troubled, that they would recognize that he indeed is the sovereign Lord, even though he is going to give himself over to be tortured and crucified and what's going to happen. So in preparing them, he's preparing us, right, for difficulties that may be coming or you're in them now to help us go through those things well. And some of you are like, well, I'm 95 and I've already been through a lot of things. You have. But there's still more things, okay? And God gives us, Christ gives us things that help us. And so he's preparing them as he's preparing us. So, Tom, go ahead and read the passage for us, and then we're going to come back and go through it. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, Why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me saying, I am going away, and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. But he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Thank you, Tom. That was great. Tom, by the way, is one of our shepherds. He helps to pastor our congregation. He he and his family are one of God's gifts to us, along with so many others. First thing, first point, the importance of obedience. Hopefully you saw in this text what Jesus was saying. Now, again, get it in context, okay? 
This isn't, I know you're going through hard things and it's going to be difficult for you, just like chill out for a while, just kind of coast, right? Often that's what we think of when we're thinking, well, life is really hard right now, so therefore I'm going to just kind of check out of the church, or I'm going to check out of doing my devotions, or I'm just going to kind of check out of life so that I can deal with my own things. Jesus' direction, command, to us is exactly opposite of that. He says now that you're in difficulty and things are not exactly how you want them to be and it's super hard for you right now, right? He did warn us that in this life you will have trouble, right? It's not a promise most people claim. Thank you, Jesus, I'm claiming that, right? They claim the other ones. But he tells us because he's a good shepherd, right? He doesn't paint, it's all going to be roses and sunshine and desserts, right? He says there will be those things mixed into things that are difficult for you. And he doesn't keep us from difficulty. Now, sometimes he says, you know what, we're going to go around this. Sometimes he says, I'm going to be with you in this thing. And there are reasons for it. And even in this, there's difficulty. He says, okay, so you're going through something right now, right? And I imagine that all of us in this room are going through something right now, be it a physical ailment, be it a loss of some sort, be it a a relational disconnection, be it a financial problem, or be it whatever it is. We got stuff, right? So Jesus says, hey, hey, hey. If you love me, continue to follow me, continue to obey me, continue to engage with my plan for you and my people. Verse 15, I'm going to jump into a couple places here, okay? John 14, 15, right out the gate, if you love me, conditional, if you love me, then you will what? Okay, you've read it, this is good. If you love me, then you will obey my commands. So how do we know if people indeed love Jesus? They obey Jesus' command, right? Is it easier to, to what's, what's easier, to say you love Jesus or to show you love Jesus? It's easier to say it. Talk is what? Cheap. I can say I love you, right? But if I don't show you love, do I really love you? Thank you. No. Right? So we have to ask ourselves, and Jesus says, hey, 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 guys, if you love me, okay, by the way, Jesus' love language is obedience, by the way, right? If you love me, love being the motivation. Not to earn something, not out of legalism, not out of I have to, but I get to follow you because I love you. It first starts in our heart, a love of Christ. And if you love him, then you will obey his commands. And so, if you say, well, I love him, then you say, well, wait a second, wait a second. Well, what, what did Jesus command, right? Have you, have you thought about it? What, what has he commanded? I just did a quick study just in John, right? You say, oh, I have to memorize all this stuff. You really don't. There's a few things that you do have to remember, okay? And so, here's just a quick look at John, and I want you to look at or gravitate towards at least one or two of these, okay? Here they are on the screen. Jesus said in John 1, receive me. That's the first thing. This receiving or believing in Christ. This was a command of His, right? Follow me is the next one, right? He commanded those who received Him, who believed in Him, to follow him. There's a connection between the two. Not just saying a prayer and going on your merry way. It's believing that is evidenced in following. So receive me, 
follow me, believe in the light, he said. Here's one that we looked at a few weeks ago, wash one another's feet. That was a command. This is serve each other. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do you remember that? That's a command, by the way. We have responsibility over our own heart, which is hard. He told us to love one another. Receive, follow, believe, serve, guard your heart, love. Again, this is John 14, believe in God. Again, believe in me. We're going to see this next week. Abide in me. Ask whatever you wish. Abide in my love. Again, receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, if we love Jesus, we will obey His commands. And His commands, at least in the book of John, are fairly simple. We're to receive Him. We are to believe Him. We're to follow Him. Abide, that is, be connected to Him. And again, you're going to hear about that next week as Jim brings our word next week. Connect to Him. And in our connection, we ask Him to give us what we need to do what He asks us to do, to love one another and to serve one another. So that means in the midst of, in the midst of, hear me, okay? Because you're going through something difficult, it's time to engage. Engage and continue to be engaged. You're hurting, so guess what? Go and minister to someone who is hurting, right? On your way, as you are ministering to others, the Lord will minister to you. I'm telling you, this is how it works, right? Instead of just sitting and saying, oh, woe is me, it's so hard, I wish someone would have paid attention to me, this is what I'm asking you to do. So you know what? I'm really hurting right now. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. God, where is someone? Will you show me someone who is going through something similar so I can minister to them? And as you minister to somebody, God will minister through you and to you. I have found this to be true time and time again. If you're depressed, you don't want to talk to somebody, guess what? It's time to talk to somebody. You find someone else who's probably depressed, and minister to them what you would like to hear yourself, and guess what? You both will get some healing and help. So often I see people just draw away. It's hard, so I'm going to draw away. What's going to help you is the exact opposite. Because it's hard, draw together. You see this. And so, if we love him, we will obey his commands, which means to serve, to love, to abide, to believe. And Jesus goes on in this passage, again, telling his disciples and then communicating the same to us. In verse 23, Jesus replied to them, anyone who loves me will again obey my teaching, emphasizing it again. Now, then he adds on and says, if you love me and you obey my teaching, then my Father will love them. And we, Father and Son, will come to them and Holy Spirit and make our home with them in the end and now. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Do you see that love of God is always firmly connected to obedience to God? And you cannot have one without the other. Not truly. And so Jesus is making this clear and saying, hey, listen to me. If you love me, you obey me. The the commands are not difficult. He gives us the Spirit to help us. He will live in us and we will live in Him. The Father will love us. But if you say that you love Him, then you must obey His teaching. This is how we know If people are in Christ. Now the third time, and he emphasizes this same point three times. (laughs) 
I'm looking at my chart here. If you love me, keep my commands, verse 14. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. I skipped over that. Okay. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I too will love them and show myself to them. I did talk about that. Okay, next in verse 23. Anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. My Father will love them and we will come to them, make our home in them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Okay, lastly, 1 John, by the way. So we have this in John. John, uh, the apostle, wrote the Gospel of John. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He also wrote, by the way, the book of Revelation. And he said this in 1 John, summing up this command of Jesus. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 6. He says, we know that we have come to know him. This is writing to the church. If we keep his commands. Now, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a what? Liar. Woo. And the truth is not in that person or in him. Verse 5. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him, what's that word right there? Must. Does it say must? Oh, it does say must. Must live as Jesus did. That should give you pause. <laughs> it gives me pause. Are you kidding me? I am not as selfless as Jesus is. Sometimes I am a selfish snob. Right? Maybe not be you, but it's me sometimes. I admit it. It's wrong. I repent of it. Right? Live like Jesus did? Must? How can you do that? Here's the deal. You can't do it in your own strength. Good luck with that. You last maybe an hour or two. Without me, you can do nothing. nothing. However, those who abide in Christ and Christ abides in you by His Holy Spirit empowers us, strengthens us, strengthens us, convicts us, conforms us, reminds us, helps us to do these things. God helps us. And so if you love Christ, it means you want to become like Christ. In order to become like Christ, you be a disciple of that person. People know this is true when they have superstars, right? They want to become like LeBron James, right? If you don't know who he is, he's a basketball person. Or who else should I put out there? Taylor Swift? Y'all got issues. <laughs> Just kidding. If you want to become like somebody, right, what, if you, like, look up to them, what do you do? Like, oh, you, like, read about them. You, like, follow them on whatever, Instagram or TikTok, whatever that is, or whatever. You read about them, you study them, you, you find things out. You see a basketball player, they start, like, acting like Le LeBron, or they try to, like, you know, dribble like him or dunk like him or move like him or all this stuff. The point is this. If you want to become like something, you have to follow that thing, know that thing. If you want to become like Christ, it's the same. It's the same. And so people say, hey, I love you. I want to become like you. Then we have to, we get to follow him. Right? And if people say, hey, 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 I love Jesus. Right? Okay. Do you treasure Jesus? Do you treasure him more than anything or anybody else? Have you given your life to following him? And do you follow his commands? Right? A better question for us to ask each other and to ask people is not, do you believe in Jesus? The better question is, do you follow Jesus' commands? How many people would, would rise to that standard? 
Again, it's easier to say in our society, of course I love Jesus. We went and asked people on the street, hey, 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 do you love Jesus? Most people, not everybody, most people will say, yeah. Right? But if you ask them, hey, 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 do you follow Jesus' commands? What will people say? What commands? Or I try, which is good. So in the midst of heartache, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of all of these things, continue to follow and love Christ. Now, here's the promise. Hopefully you saw this promise. The promise is of another advocate. So Jesus says, obey, 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 right? Hmm. And he promises us another advocate. By the way... Jesus also obeyed. Do you know this? Right. Now, do you see that in this section, um, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, made a clarification. He had already left the room. Right. Judas, um, the other disciple Judas, asked Jesus, hey, Jesus, you said you're going to show yourself to us like in the resurrection. Why don't you show everybody? Right? Because if everybody saw you, wouldn't, um, wouldn't they all believe in you? Right? Which is a legitimate question. Right? Jesus then doesn't answer that directly in the beginning. He says, obey me. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. Hey, I'm going to give you peace. And oh, by the way, I'm going to tell you that the enemy is coming. Right? This is kind of really, really interesting. This is in verse uh, 30, John 14, 30. He says, I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming, which is the devil, Satan, coming to do his bidding. He has, not, he has no hold over me in the sense of there is nothing in Jesus, no sin that was there that he would have to uh, obey, quote-unquote, the devil. But he comes so that the world may learn. So the devil comes so the world would learn that Jesus loves the Father and that he does exactly what his Father has commanded him. So Jesus does exactly, he exactly obeys the command of his Father. There's obedience in this. Right? So that the world will learn that he loves God. So Jesus then is showing the world who he is on the cross. The world's going to see me on the cross, obeying my Father, even in the midst of the enemy coming which helps us then when the devil comes after you, and yes, there is a devil, and yes, he comes after us because we love God. When this happens, this is an opportunity for us to overcome. It's an opportunity for us to continue to obey Jesus in the midst of even spiritual attack. Do you understand that? Okay. Jesus is saying that I'm going to show the world who I am on the cross, but if you want to see me in my resurrected form, I'm showing myself to those who believe. So what he's asking us to do is be obedient to him, and in obedience to him, we show that we love him, and he himself showed love for the Father and obedience to him, even though it was difficult trusting that what he's going to and what he's going to do is going to be better than and overcome the difficulties that he's going through. That's a big statement, okay? But this is what he said, and he says this, the promise of another advocate. Here we are, John 14, verse 16. Jesus told them, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. So we have to ask ourselves, well, who's the first advocate? <laughs> Guess who it is? Jesus, right? God sent Christ as an advocate. This is someone who supports us, someone who defends us. Okay. Christ <laughs> supports us in the sense of taking our place, standing in the gap in our place, taking the wrath of God and our sin on ourselves so that we can become the righteousness of God, okay? And He sustains us and supports us, showing us the way, encouraging us, advocating for us. 
to God. Jesus sent another advocate. He's the first advocate. This is 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Dear children, I write to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who is it? Jesus Christ. The what? Righteous one. Jesus the righteous one is the first advocate, but he was saying, guys, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you another advocate, someone that could help you, someone that will support you, someone that will sustain you, someone who will be with you forever. And who is this? It is the spirit of truth. This is John 14, 17, 8. So as Jesus goes, he sends his Holy Spirit one of the names of the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Is truth an issue in our society? Yeah. Well, live your truth. Right? We like that, right? Because everyone can just kind of do their thing. Well, it's my truth. But is it true? Well, true versus what? Mm, Jesus said he was the way and then the what? Oh, you know that one. Huh. Way of the truth and the life. Right? So what God declares is true is true, regardless of your opinion of it. Well, I don't believe it. <laughs> God never asks for your opinion on what's true or not. He says this is true. You can either live according to it or live against it. Pilate asked this question of Jesus, what is true? truth. In our society, we're looking for truth, and we think every opinion, therefore, is true. It is not, because it does not coexist with reality. People believe that the earth is flat. It's not. Some of you are alarmed right now, I know. I'm just kidding. It's not. Well, why? Because it doesn't correspond with reality. Well, I still believe it's true, therefore it's true. You're wrong. You are not the author of truth. Jesus is. God is. And so the spirit of truth helps us. Helps us to know what the truth is. Truth about God. Truth about ourselves. Truth about our planet. Truth about so many things. And we have to ask, ask God, God, help us to know what is true and to follow after you. He comes along to help us, to coach us, to comfort us, to teach us, to admonish us. And Jesus continues in 14, 17. He says, now the world cannot accept him. That's the Holy Spirit. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him and he lives with you and will be in you. I have not left you as orphans. I will come to you, but before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live, and on that day you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. So the world cannot accept the Spirit of truth or the Holy Spirit. How does, why is that? Well, because in order to receive the Holy Spirit, we first must believe in Christ. We say amen to that, right? The Holy Spirit then comes into us, okay, transforms us, gives us a new identity. That's the deal about baptism. It is an outward symbol of an inward condition that we're dead with Christ, we're raised new with Christ. Even though we still have a sin nature to deal with that is dying, we're asked to put to death that thing. We become new, and the Holy Spirit makes us new and lives in us and encourages us and helps us. You do not receive the Holy Spirit without believing in Christ. And so the world cannot see Him. <laughs> they don't know Him, but this is a gift to those who believe. Aren't you glad that Christ didn't leave and then said, all right, good luck, all y'all, right? He doesn't leave us as, here's the word, orphans. Those who have no one to protect them, no one to guide them, no one to care for them, no one to watch over them. He says, I'm not leaving you like that, but I'm giving you an advocate, 
I'm giving you someone who will lead you and guide you and empower you and protect you and help you. Receive this. This is what I'm giving you. Verse 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. My wife has a a mentor. Uh, Her name is Arlene. She has been in her life for uh, a long time. She's probably since she was 16, and now she's in a nursing home. She has uh, Lewy body dementia, which is a horrible form of dementia. And we saw her um, digress and digress and digress, and she's there in a nursing home even right now. And when um, she was having her hallucinations, it was very, very difficult. And then sometimes she would come to her, her senses. And her number one prayer, this is her number one prayer. This is Arlene. She said, I don't want to deny my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Pray for me, Gretchen. Pray for me, Dave. That even in the midst of going through this disease, that I won't forget my Savior. And even as she's sitting there and sometimes she comes lucid, We play a a Christian song, and she confesses the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is working in her to remind her of the truth that is in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit will help you, remind you, and teach you, illuminating the Scripture so that we can understand it. Do we still need teachers? We surely do. We need people to help us, but the Holy Spirit is the one who is working. He gives us his Holy Spirit. Ask, seek, follow, trust. Lastly is this, the gift of peace. He gives us the gift of peace. This is John 14, 27. He said this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Can you say amen to that right there? The world has a lack of peace. He continues and says, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Are there things in the world that are frightening? There are things in your world that frighten you. What if I can no longer work? What if my spouse abandons me? What if? If I cannot pay the bills and the world is in deep need of peace. And Jesus, in the midst of their circumstance, in the midst of not keeping them out of difficult things, he says, hey, in the difficult things, I'm going to give you peace. And the peace I give you is not (laughs) as the world gives. And the world's peace is what? You can do it. Right? Pull yourself up on your own strength. Hey, the economy will turn around. Hey, you're strong enough. You're smart enough. You can do it. Right? It's all in our strength. Right? Guess what? You can't always do it. You don't have the strength. You don't have the energy. You don't have the wisdom. You don't have the power. You don't even have the desire sometimes. But the peace that God gives is a peace of recognizing that He is with us even to the end of the age. This is peace that comes internally, not based on external circumstances, but on internal conditions. God never promised that everything's going to go well for you. He did promise that He's going to be with you in all things. Is that everybody's phone or just one phone? It's It's all right. Phones happen. So if you are troubled and afraid, I want you to turn to Christ and ask him for his peace. That's That's the best I can tell you. 
God, give me your peace in this. Help me. And he says, peace I leave with you. Don't let your hearts be troubled, which is what we are to do. Do not be afraid. Okay, coming for a landing. Like I said, Jim Black is going to be teaching, preaching next week on a great passage of scripture. Not that this one isn't. John 15, by another branches. That's going to be next Sunday. But today I want you to remember a couple things. Number one, remember how important it is to continue to love Jesus by obeying his commands. Especially in times of difficulty and darkness. I want you to know that he is with you by a spirit of truth. He is supporting and he's defending you. And you are not alone. Know that Jesus has given us his gift of peace, so let your mind focus on this promise of what is to come. By the way, your ending is secure, and he will be with you even to the very end of the age. And there are times in which we need um, to pray for one another. We need to pray for one another a lot. And over here, every Sunday, there's people that are designated, they're there to pray for you. I want to encourage you to do that. I would encourage you to pray for each other, even where we sit, because at times we need help, and this is what we're asked to do, to pray for one another, to love one another. I encourage you to do that. So I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to close in prayer, and then we'll close with a, with a song after that. So let's pray. Father, there's a lot going on in my heart and mind this morning, a lot going on in our hearts and minds. God, as we uh, look to our world, Lord, and we look even to this next week, God, there's a lot of things that makes us anxious, God. God, we recognize, Jesus, that in this, whatever we're facing, that you have asked us to continue, you've actually commanded us to continue, to love you and to do what you've asked us to do. And God, I ask that you would help us, God, to do this especially for those who are hurting really deeply today. I ask in their obedience and out of love of you, God, I know that you're going to minister to them in it. Thank you for doing that. God, I pray for those who are um, afraid, God, lacking peace. There's a wringing of hands, so to speak, and a definite knot in the heart or in the stomach. God, I ask that you administer peace to those folks. Knowing, God, that you are there, knowing that you will not forsake us, knowing that your spirit is continuing to work, God, will you do that? And Jesus, I ask that you help us to, to see you and to follow your Holy Spirit. We're grateful that you have given us him to be with us, to live in us, as we continue to look to follow after you. So help us as a congregation, God. You know, we're going to sing a song. We're going to go our various ways. God, I ask in that, Lord, that we would see you and that we'd represent you, God, and you would work in us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.